Good evening, aspirants. Welcome to Daily News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 11th October 2023. Displayed here are the list of topics we are going to see today. Now, before we get into the discussion, I have two important announcements. The first announcement is regarding a new initiative by Shankar IAS Academy. We have started analysis of Indian Express newspaper and the video will be published on every Sunday. A week's newspaper is covered in one video. The second announcement is regarding pre-storming test series. The second batch of pre-storming test series is going to start on 15th October 2023. The first test will happen on 22nd October. So interested aspirants can make use of it and boost your prelims preparation. With this, we can start our discussion. Look at this editorial article. This article is speaking about prevalence of gender gap. Recently, the World Economic Forum has published 17th edition of Global Gender Gap Report. This report was drafted based on data from 146 countries. The report says that it will take 131 years to close the gender gap at current rate of progress. The report also noted that it will take around 149 years to close the gender gap in populous South Asian countries, including India. By highlighting this report, the author said that Historically, women were neglected for high roles including political leadership in world and in India. Then the author welcomed the Indian government's decision to provide 33% reservation for women in parliament and state legislative assemblies. But the author is also concerned that society is still not allowing women to get empowered. So this is the crux of the editorial. In this context, we will understand the important constitutional provisions and other legislations related to women empowerment in India. As usual, we will approach this topic with the mains answer writing come interactive approach. Before that, let us look at the syllabus. In prelims, this topic comes under economic and social development, sustainable development, poverty inclusion, demographics, social sector initiatives. In mains, this topic falls under GS paper 2 and it comes under the topic of Indian Constitution, Historical Underpinnings, Evolution, Features, Amendments, Significant Provisions and Basic Structure. It also comes under the topic of Welfare Schemes for Vulnerable Section of Population by Central and State Governments. So this is all about the syllabus. Now let us begin our discussion. Take a look at this question. Laws have acted as catalyst for societal transformation. In this context, critically examine the effectiveness of laws aimed at empowering women in India. So this is the question. Here the key word is critically examine. It means we have to provide drawbacks or negative aspects of the particular topic after explaining about the topic. So here the question asks us to critically examine the effectiveness of laws that are aimed at empowering women in India. So for this question we have to provide drawbacks of Indian laws related to women empowerment. Before providing the drawbacks of laws, we have to provide important legislations related to women empowerment. So this is how we are going to approach this question. First let us start with the introduction. See this question is related to women empowerment. So we can start our intro by writing definition of women empowerment. Now coming to the definition. According to United Nations, women empowerment is defined as a process of promoting women's ability to determine their own choices and promoting women's right to influence social change for themselves and others. So to put it simply, women empowerment refers to process of improving the status of women in terms of economic, social, political and health matters. So women empowerment is a crucial aspect to achieve gender equality by eliminating discriminatory practices against women. To empower women, India has enacted many laws and also has constitutional provisions. So this can be a intro for the question. Now coming to the body of the answer. As the question contains the word critically examine, we can split the body of the answer into two parts. In the first part, we are going to explain important constitutional provisions and important laws related to women empowerment in India. Now first let us see the constitutional provisions. We will start with fundamental rights. Take the article 14. This article ensures equality before law or equal protection of laws within the country. This means that government should not provide any favor to particular individuals or communities while enforcing the law. So this article eliminates a discrimination against anyone including women when it comes to law enforcement. 
so thereby it empowers the woman the second one is article 15 this article provides for prohibition of discrimination it says that state shall not discriminate against any citizen on the grounds of religion race caste sex or place of birth or of any of the matters so as per this article the government shall not discriminate against any gender including woman also note that article 15 class 3 states that the government should make special provisions in favor of women and children so this in turn will help the woman empowerment now look at the article 16 this article provides for equality of opportunity in matters of public employment so it states that there shall be equality of opportunity for all citizens in the matter of public employment or appointment to any office under government so this ensures that women should not be discriminated in terms of public employment so this is all about the important provisions under fundamental rights regarding the safeguards to women now coming to the dpsp part first let us take the article 39 of dpsp according to this article the government has to formulate policies for adequate means of livelihood for both men and women so this article empowers the woman to secure adequate livelihood then under the article 39 class d the government has to secure equal pay for equal work for both men and women so as per this article the government has to ensure that there is no discrimination to women regarding wages then there is another provision under dpsp article 42 see this article contains some important provisions for the benefit of women as per the article the government has to ensure that there are adequate conditions in workplace to accommodate women employees also the government has to provide maternity benefits to women employees through suitable legislations so this is all about the important provisions from dpsp regarding women empowerment apart from these constitutional provisions the government also empowered women by providing reservations in local bodies as we all know the government has gave constitutional status to local bodies by enacting 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment acts these amendment acts also provided that one third of seats should be reserved for women in panchayati raj institutions so this increased the participation of women in local governance which in turn empowered the woman then recently the government has enacted a woman reservation act which gave 33 percent reservation for women in parliament and also in state legislative assemblies so this reservation is going to be implemented after 2029 so these are the important provisions in constitution related to women empowerment now coming to the important laws created by government firstly the government has set up national commission for women in 1992 so this body is continuously working to improve the status of women and their economic empowerment it also advises the government on all policy matters affecting women secondly the government brought dowry prohibition act in 1961 so this act was enacted to prevent any form of dowry thirdly the government has enacted hindu widow remarriage act 1856 so this allowed hindu widow woman to remarry and the widow woman can also enjoy all rights on par with married woman finally the government has brought hindu marriage act in 1955 this act has recognized the equal rights of men and women in the matters of marriage and divorce apart from this the government has also brought in various schemes like beti padavo beti bachavo pm ujwala stand up india and many schemes to empower women in india so this is all about the important legislations enacted by indian government to empower women see i have explained various provisions here in your answer don't explain like what i did just mention the provisions it is enough now coming to the second part of the body of answer in this part we have to provide drawbacks of legislation related to women empowerment now let us see the drawbacks one by one the first drawback is due to the patriarchal mindset of society despite fundamental rights providing equal opportunity for women some families do not let the woman to explore the public sector jobs this hinders the progress of women and their empowerment secondly the ineffectiveness of dpsp is also a major drawback as we all know dpsp is not enforceable by courts so despite dpsp containing provisions for benefits of women it is not properly implemented by government 
Then the third drawback is related to reservation. We saw that there is 33% reservation for women in local bodies. But the problem here is that this legislation does not really empower women. See, the women are just made to stand in elections to comply with the reservation rules. But after winning, their husbands are playing a major role in taking the decisions. Then the fourth drawback is related to limited role of National Commission for Women. See, this body is a statutory body, but the recommendations of National Commission for Women are not binding on the government. Then the final drawback is related to Dowry Prohibition Act. See, this act has prohibited the practice of dowry. But dowry is still continuing at the back doors of Indian marriages. So this also poses a hindrance to women empowerment. This is all about the drawbacks of legislation related to women empowerment. So we have completed the body part. Now let us see the conclusion. See, we have to provide a balanced conclusion for this answer. The conclusion can be like, Women empowerment is a much needed one to achieve gender parity. So the government should enforce legislation effectively to address discriminatory practices against women. The government can collaborate with private, NGOs, civil society organization and so on to create awareness about evil practices like dowry, hate speech against women and so on. And finally, it is the society that should recognize the need for gender parity by eliminating patriarchal mindset. So this can be a balanced conclusion for this answer. So that's all about this discussion. Let us move to the next topic. Now take a look at this article. This article here is about traditional medicine. The main point conveyed in this article is that some people are doing a disservice to nation by entirely rejecting the traditional medical system. While some people are doing a disservice to traditional medical system by equating it to nationalism. The author of the article has few words for both kinds of these people. According to the author of the article, people who entirely reject the traditional medical system must first accept a few facts. Firstly, the traditional medical practice like Ayurveda is reason or evidence based unlike Adarva Veda which is faith based. So although Ayurveda is old and traditional, it is still scientific. Secondly, ignoring the traditional medicine in its entirety is not rational. This is because traditional medicine has undergone repeated informal verification over many generations. So ignoring traditional medicines altogether is ignoring valuable medical experience. Then for people who blindly uphold the traditional medical system, the author has following suggestions. Firstly, the physiological basis of traditional medicines like Ayurveda is not sound. So it must be improved upon so that there is more acceptance among the people. Secondly, evidence-based appraisal must be done to all traditional medical systems. Only this will help identify the useful aspects of traditional medicine. So by following these suggestions, the positive aspects of traditional and western medical system can be integrated. And this will ensure overall wellness of the people according to the author. So this is all about this article. Moving forward, let us see some exam relevant information about traditional medical system. First, let us start looking at the significance of traditional medicines. Firstly, the traditional medical system adopts a holistic approach. That is, it considers not only the physical health of individual, but also their mental, emotional and spiritual well-being. The traditional medicines emphasize mainly on preventive health care. It encourages a healthy lifestyle including dietary habits, daily routines and use of herbal remedies to prevent diseases and maintain well-being. Traditional medicines are cost effective. This makes it accessible to wide range of people especially in rural areas. Also the cost effectiveness of traditional medicine will help reduce the out of pocket expenditure for medical spending. Traditional medicines are non-invasive. Also, the side effects associated with the traditional medicines are very minimal. This makes traditional medicine appealing to lot of people. See, traditional medicines can be easily integrated with modern medicine. They can be used as a complementary to modern medicines like allopathy. So, this allows people to benefit from strength of both systems. Lastly, traditional medical systems like Ayurveda and Yoga promote cultural tourism. People from around the world visit India for Ayurvedic treatments and wellness experiences thereby boosting the country's economy. 
So these are some of the advantages and significance of traditional medicines. Finally, let us look at the steps taken to promote Ayush in India. Firstly, the government created an entire ministry called the Ministry of Ayush to promote traditional medical system in our country. Then there is a national Ayush mission launched by Ministry of Ayush. The main aim of this mission is to increase the availability and accessibility of Ayush healthcare services. This is done through a network of Ayush health wellness centers. As a part of this mission, the ministry also plans to strengthen Ayush educational systems to create a quality workforce for traditional medical system. The next one is Ayur Swastya Yojana. This is a central sector scheme under Ayush ministry. Through this, government supports the establishment of specialized Ayush medical health units in various cities. Then there is Ayush Entrepreneurship Development Program. This is created under Ministry of Ayush along with Ministry of MSME. This is aimed to promote Ayush sector in the country under different schemes of Ministry of MSME. The Ayush Ministry also launched an app called Ayush Clinical Case Repository Portal. ACCR portal. This platform aims at supporting both the Ayush practitioners and also to the public. In this platform, the Ayush practitioners can share information about traditional medicines. This is first reviewed by experts, then later uploaded in the platform for welfare of the public. The government also introduced some provisions in Biological Diversity Amendment Act 2023. Lastly, India is promoting yoga worldwide through International Yoga Day since 2014. So these are some of the important steps taken by government to promote the traditional medical system in India. So this is all about this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this news article. It talks about the establishment of second space port of ISRO. This space port will be established at Kulasekra Patinam in Tutukudi district of Tamil Nadu. See, the ISRO has announced that the port will be dedicated exclusively for the launch of small satellite launch vehicles, that is SSLV. Moreover, this space port will be developed by a private sector as a part of Indian Space Policy 2023. So this is all about the news. In our news analysis today, we are going to discuss about the important launch sites of ISRO and also some important prelims facts about SSLV. Firstly, let us see about the launch sites of ISRO in detail. See, there were three major rocket launch sites in India. Vikram Sarabhai Space Center at Tiruvananthapuram in Kerala, Satish Dhawan Space Center at Sriharikota in Andhra Pradesh, Dr. Abdul Kalam Island at Badrak in Odisha. So these are the three major rocket launch sites in India. Now let us see them in brief. First is Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. It is situated at Tiruvananthapuram in Kerala. This space center is named after father of Indian space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. It was earlier called as Tumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station and it was started in 1963. Know that the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center is the largest rocket launching site in India. The main activity in this area is designing and development of satellite launch vehicles and associated technologies. The second one is Satish Dhawan Space Center. It is located in Sriharikota in Andhra Pradesh. It was established in 1969. Know that there were many strategic advantages for this particular space center. Firstly, it is close to the equator. Secondly, it has large uninhabited space nearby. Thirdly, it lies along a large coastline. So these factors make it as an ideal site for India's space mission. Most of the Indian satellite launches are currently performed from this site. Now coming to the Dr. Abdul Kalam Island. It is formerly called as Wheeler Island and it is located on the coast of Odisha. Note that Integrated Test Range Missile Testing Facility is also located here. This site is operated by Defense Research and Development Organization that is DRDO. So these are the three important rocket launching sites of India. Recently, Chennai-based startup called Agnikul Cosmos inaugurated India's first private space vehicle launch pad at Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sriharikota. So this is all about the launch sites of ISRO. Now let us see some basic information about 
small satellite launch vehicles that is SSLV. SSLV is a new class of launch vehicles developed by ISRO and it is capable of carrying satellites of weight up to 500 kilograms. Know that the launch vehicle will carry the small satellites into 500 km low earth orbit. The SSLV is a three stage launch vehicle and note that all the three stages are solid fuels. In addition to this three solid stage fuels, there is an additional terminal stage called liquid fuel based velocity trimming module VTM. Also know that SSLV is used to target nano and micro satellites which weigh around 10 kg to 100 kg respectively. The important advantage is that SSLV provides low cost access to space, offers low turnaround time, flexibility in accommodating multiple satellites and demands minimal launch infrastructure. So these are some of the advantages of SSLV. With this, we conclude this discussion. Let us move to the next topic. Look at this article. Yesterday, October 10 was celebrated as World Mental Health Day. The theme of this year is Mental Health is a Universal Human Right. Know that the main aim of the day is to improve awareness about mental health. It also stresses on actions needed to protect everyone's mental health. India being a pioneer took several steps to improve the mental health of the people. In Union Budget 2022, government announced National Telemental Health Program of India called Telemental Health Assistance and Networking Across States which is shortly called as Telemanas. This program aims to improve the mental health of the people in country. Know that Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is responsible for the overall implementation of this program. So in our discussion today, we are going to see about Telemanas program in detail. First of all, Telemanas stands for Telemental Health Assistance and Networking Across States. It was launched in October 2022. Know that the aim of the program is to provide free telemental health services across the country. It was aimed at serving the people particularly in remote or underserved areas. Let us see the agency responsible for the implementation. See the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences headquartered at Bengaluru is the national level nodal agency for this program. It coordinates the activities of telemono services across India. Know that the services are available in 20 languages based on the language as selected by the states. A toll-free helpline number 14416 has been set up across the country. The users will be allowed to select the language of their choice for availing mental health services. So this is all about the provisions of the scheme. Now let us see the structural part of the scheme. The telemonos program is organized into two tier system. The tier 1 comprises of state telemonos cells which includes the trained counsellors and mental health specialist. The tier 2 comprises of specialist at district mental health program or medical college resources for physical consultation or e sanjeevani for audio visual consultation. So look at this diagram. This is how the telemonos system works. Finally let us see the need for such kind of program. Government of India conducted the National Mental Health Survey of India in 2016. The results were shocking as it states that prevalence of mental disorders in adults above the age of 18 years is about 10.6%. The treatment gap for mental disorder range between 70% to 92% for different disorders. So this pathetic situation was also increased by COVID-19 pandemic. So the government launched this scheme to improve the mental health of the people of country. So this is all about the Telemanas program. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this news. Last week 14 people died in a firecracker accident in Karnataka. Following this, the Karnataka government has issued various safety measures. These measures included ban on bursting conventional firecrackers during public events and festivals. So instead of conventional crackers, the government has advised to use green crackers in the state. So this is the crux of the news. In our discussion, we are going to see some important facts about green crackers for our prelims exam. Firstly, what is meant by green crackers? Green crackers are also called eco-friendly crackers. 
they will reduce less noise pollution and also less air pollution. These green crackers are developed by Council for Scientific and Industrial Research that is CSIR in collaboration with National Environmental Engineering Research Institute that is NIRI. These crackers were created in 2018. Now let us see some important characteristics of green crackers. As we have seen earlier, these crackers release 30% less pollution than traditional crackers. They will also emit less noise and it is in the range of 100 to 130 decibels. In order to distinguish green crackers from normal crackers, these crackers have a green logo and a quick response code. So in this way we can identify the green crackers from other conventional crackers. Now let us see the three important varieties of green crackers. The first variety is safe water releaser. These crackers reduce the amount of dust released by a cracker by releasing water vapor in the air. It does not contain potassium nitrate and sulfur. And also note that the particulate dust released by this cracker is 30% less than normal crackers. The second variety is safe thermite cracker. It does not contain potassium nitrate and sulfur. So it will result in reduced emission of particulate matter and reduced sound intensity. The safe minimal aluminium. This is the third variety. As the name suggests, it uses minimum aluminium for the cracker. These crackers use magnesium in the place of aluminium. So it will produce less sound compared to traditional crackers. So these are the important points regarding green crackers. Now let us move to the next topic. Now look at this article. Last August an aircraft parts supplier company called Celestial Aviation Services Limited approached the National Company Law Tribunal. The company had approached the tribunal to initiate insolvency proceedings against SpiceJet Airline. See the SpiceJet Airlines has earlier acquired aircraft parts from this company but it did not pay money in time. So that's why the Celestial Aviation Company approached the NCLT. So this is the news article. In this discussion let us understand some points about National Company Law Tribunal that is NCLT. The NCLT was constituted in 2016 under the Companies Act 2013. As it was created based on the Parliamentary Act, it is a statutory body. The NCLT was formed to deal with corporate disputes that are of civil nature. See the NCLT works on the lines of normal civil court in the country. But note that it is constituted to specifically deal with civil corporate disputes arising under Companies Act 2013. The NCLT decides the matters in accordance with the principles of natural justice. Since it is performing the judicial functions, NCLT is a quasi-judicial authority. The principal bench is at New Delhi. Apart from this, it also has other benches at Ahmedabad, Allahabad, Bengaluru, Chandigarh, Chennai, Gohati, Hyderabad, Kolkata and Mumbai. So with these basics, let us see the composition of NCLT. The NCLT consists of President and some other judicial and technical members. The President of the Tribunal will be appointed by Central Government after consultation with Chief Justice of India. Note that the President of NCLT must be a Judge of High Court. Now coming to the members. The members of the Tribunal are appointed by Central Government based on recommendation of a selection committee. So this is all about the composition of NCLT. Now finally let us see the important functions of NCLT. Firstly, the National Company Law Tribunal adjudicates the cases related to insolvency and liquidation of corporate companies. See, this role of NCLT is mandated under Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. Here note that NCLT deals with insolvency of only corporate persons under the code. But in case of insolvency proceedings of individuals and partnerships, it will be dealt by Debt Recovery Tribunal. Secondly, the NCLT deals with cases pending under Sick Industrial Companies Special Provisions Act 1985. See, this act was enacted to detect the sick companies that has potential systematic financial risk. So, if any cases filed under such act, it will be dealt by NCLT. Finally, NCLT deals with proceedings related to Companies Act 2013 such as arbitration, arrangement, 
compromise, reconstruction and winding up of company. So the appeals against the decisions of National Company Law Tribunal are placed before National Company Law Appellate Tribunal NCLAT and the decisions of this NCLAT can be appealed before Supreme Court. So this is all about National Company Law Tribunal. Now let us move to the next topic. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question. It is about Manas program in India. Look at the first statement. It aims to provide tele mental health services to people in India. Yes, this statement is correct. Look at the second statement. Indian Council of Medical Research is a nodal agency for overall implementation of the scheme. This statement is incorrect because National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences is the nodal agency for this program. Now look at this third statement. The scheme was modeled on achievement of mental health care scheme of Canada. Yes, this statement is correct. So only two statements are correct. The correct answer is option B. Now moving on to the second question. It is about National Company Law Tribunal. Look at the first statement. It deals with corporate disputes that are of civil and criminal nature. This statement is incorrect because NCLT deals with corporate disputes that are of only civil in nature. Look at the second statement. The decisions of NCLT can be directly appealed before Supreme Court. This statement is incorrect. This is because the decisions of NCLT can be appealed before National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. So this statement is incorrect. Now look at the third statement. It deals with insolvency cases of corporate persons under Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. This statement is correct. So the correct answer is option A. Only one. Now these are the mains practice questions for you today. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. Now we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.